I can hardly believe this is Sunday evening already. It seems like I just got here a few hours ago. Before I begin, though, tonight, um, I do want to just take a moment to uh, thank you all for your hospitality. Uh, Dagmar and Wenzel uh, let us be in their home, and we appreciate that so much, my wife and I. Also, there were some ladies here in the church that made us a fruit basket uh, like none other. And I don't know who that was, but I just want to, for my wife and I, I just want to say thank you very much. That was very uh, kind of you, and we've uh, enjoyed that very much uh, today. Also, um, I want to let you know, if you wanted to be taking notes or were taking notes and you missed a reference, I will be leaving a copy of the PowerPoints with the pastor and you can uh, request a copy from him. That's probably just the easiest way to do that um, for those of you who might you know, want to go through this. And I, it, I don't consider this uh, my material. Now I put a copyright on the, you know, the beginning of the, of the PowerPoints only for the purpose that, with a, uh, a little ex um, explanation there that says, please don't use this information to go out and bash the church or you know, start uh, arguments with your fellow church members. That's not what this is for. This is to go home and look in the mirror and say, God, what about me? That's what it's about. That's what it did to me. I had a young person uh, I heard about. He, he picked up my book. And it's not really, I say my book, it's God's history. And he got about 100 pages into it, and his response was to go into the bathroom on his knees and personally repent for where he had failed God. That, you know, that's the Holy Spirit working. And so I don't know what, how the Holy Spirit, you know, this whole weekend wants to speak to you. There, there may be things that, that come across your mind that I never would have even thought of. And, and I just say, praise the Lord. That's the way the Lord works with us. And I would also say that I'm just scratching the surface. surface and, and thank you, Pastor, for saying that. Um, I can't, there's so much out there in this history that is rich, that we can learn from. And I would just say, I hope if you learn one thing, it's that God has left this history for us and we can learn from it. And uh, don't take my word for it. Go dig out these articles and read those camp meeting uh, revival stories for yourself. It's amazing what God was doing. The other thing I'd like to mention too is just the idea of righteousness by faith. And I know some have mentioned this before and they've said, well, hey, you didn't really get into all the details of righteousness by faith. And that's true. My biggest emphasis, or the, the biggest point I'm trying to get across over a series like this, is that God did send a message, and it brought revival, and we need to go study into that and pray the Lord will bring that message in, as an experience into our own lives and in our church. And so I'm in no way saying this is the final word. This is just to say we need this message more than any time before and our young people need it too and by God's grace may we be an example to them well we started out this week on a Friday night talking about the great controversy and the main point of all of that was to say that since the very beginning every time God has sought to proclaim the plan of salvation Satan is there trying to distort and confuse minds and to bring in uh, heresy and falsehood and fanaticism to try to disrupt what God is doing. Sabbath morning, we talked about why history is important. The Bible is a book of history, and even our own Adventist history is left there for us to learn 
so that the next generation can not only praise the Lord for his goodness and the way he's uh, through miracles and divine uh, providence led his people but also to be warned by from the mistakes that have been made by our fathers and their fathers and so on we also saw how God raised up this church how he gave them a message how he organized this church to go out to the world with a message the end of that 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 building of the temple that reformation that had begun years before and yet how as early as 1850 a Laodicean condition had come into the church but God had the remedies, and by the end of that first generation, although Ellen White said the Lord could have come before this, God was still bringing message to this church, and through a train of events, even though James uh, and Ellen White felt that a new emphasis needed to be given to the message, James White went to his rest, but God promised he would raise up others, and he did, and within a few years, Ellen White recognized that same topic and emphasis in the preaching of Jones and Wagner, a fulfillment of that very promise that God had made. So Sabbath morning we looked at that most important meeting, how God had brought that to the church, and how there was such a mixed response. And then the next two meetings we looked at how when that message then went out to the people in the camp meetings and other ministerial meetings, how there had been revivals and miracles wrought as uh, that message took hold of people's hearts. We also saw how there was even divine healings, spiritually as well as physically, and we talked about um, that taking place through several of those camp meetings into the summer of 1892. We looked at how Ellen White had said so clearly that the loud cry that message of Revelation 18.1 which Adventists had been talking about for 40 years was happening now, 1892. And she proclaimed that so clearly, and we got up to about the fall of 1892, and that's where we left off last night. So this evening, I wanna kinda of start there and talk about some more of the revivals that were taking place during that very time. Well, Battle Creek College, 1892, W.W. Prescott was the principal or the president of Battle Creek College and he uh, as I mentioned before had been one who kind of got caught up a little bit in that in the uh, resistance to this message early on and how he had been convicted almost immediately after Minneapolis in uh, December of 1888 and had repented of that and on several other occasions he actually stood up publicly and repented for his slowness to accept this beautiful message. Well, in 1891, he actually, as a, he was also a General Conference uh, Education Secretary, and so he had actually uh, gotten together a or organized a education institute um, where all the teachers would come together in the spring of 1891, and it was Prescott's desire that they get rid of all the classics and all the Shakespeare and all that nonsense, and that this message be put in the center of all education. So that young people were trained to not only have a personal experience, but then to go out and share in whatever area of life their talents were, a message, a life-changing message. So in this fall of 1892, of course, Prescott is speaking at camp meetings. He's involved in some of these very revivals. And he calls together the faculty there in the fall of 1892, and he says, we want this year to be different, even better. And at the end of the fall quarter, they always had a week of prayer in the, the month of December, the church-wide did. And this was kind of a high time when they would get together and have a, a full week of meetings. And Prescott wanted the school to be ready for those meetings. And so he didn't want to wait until December, you know, a week before the, the week of prayer. He wanted to start at the very beginning of the school year. And so he called the faculty together and he said, we want to be praying for this week of prayer. Even though it's three months away, we want to be getting ready for it now. And they did that. But this is what happened, and this is how he describes what took place. Notice, as always in such cases as this, notice, the enemy seemed to make an effort to bring trouble 
into the school. Is that not exactly what we saw Friday night? God works, and then what does the devil do? Then the devil steps in and tries to thwart what God is doing. And so on Thanksgiving Day, November 24, four of our students, two ladies and two gentlemen, arranged for a clandestine ride together. Their plan was successfully carried out through deception and the matter covered up in the same way. But the next day, a clue to it was given indirectly and very soon the whole matter was known. So this is a college setting. These are young people between the ages of probably as young as 12, you know, up into the late teens and maybe early 20s. And so they had rules. One of those were you didn't go out especially in the evening uh, in a mixed group unless you had a chaperone with you and these students had snuck out of the dorms, gotten together and gone for a, either a sleigh ride or a buggy ride of some sort. Well, this is what P.T. McGann said about the incident. He was a Bible teacher and a history teacher there at the time, young man, and he had been one who rejoiced in the message of righteousness by faith, just so you know a little bit about P.T. McGann. And he says, on Thanksgiving uh, the 24th, uh, four of our students went out for a buggy ride. The thing was contraband. They had no permission. There was two ladies, Miss Rose Neal and Miss Florence Branham, and two gentlemen, Mr. Clayton and Ed Prescott. This was the nephew of W.W. Prescott. And W.W. Prescott's brother had been an Adventist and he had left the church and just basically became an agnostic and of course his son had been affected by that but still was there at Battle Creek School and now he was one of the four uh, students that had gotten into trouble. The matter came to light. Professor Prescott was away. Some of them falsified about it when, they inter when interviewed by members of the faculty. So now they were not only had done this but they lied about the situation. Now W.W. W. Prescott was away and the reason he was away was because he was in Walla Walla, Washington at the very start of Walla Walla College and so he was actually away for two months in this fall quarter. Wouldn't return until just a few days before the week of prayer. Well what do you do? There's this attempt to get the school going on a strong spiritual direction and then there's this trouble that comes up. Well, on the following Sunday morning, on November 27, the matter came up before the faculty and the guilt of all four was clearly um, established. But the measure of their punishment was another thing. Both of the boys were infidels, or nearly so, all four had been into many scraps. Some members of the faculty were for putting them out. Others were doubtful as to whether this would be the best course to pursue. The motion was before the house to have them publicly censured before the whole school and put on probation. So you can understand the faculty were trying to decide what do we do with these students? You know, we're, we're trying to get the college going a certain direction. And then you've got these kids in trouble. When I first read this, I thought, well, that makes sense. Put the kids up front and say, look, you all know, already know they're, they're in trouble, and this is what they did, and now they're on probation. Now let that be a warning to you. But notice what P.T. McGann says. I then told the faculty plainly that I, for one, could not vote on the question at all. It looked to me like this, that the Lord had not shown us what to do. Because in their present condition, the school was better off without them, especially as one of the boys had made it a point to propagate his infidelity whenever he could, and the other was inclined that way. I felt, says McGann, that the Lord was going to work and that if we could take the burden of these precious souls upon us, that he would work and we would be shown the way out. After I had spoken, it became manifest that there was a good many others of the faculty who felt the same way on the matter, and we got a motion through to defer a decision for the time being. In other words, let's not decide what to do. Let's ask God what to do. Well, when the, we, we then told the faculty, uh, McGann continues, that we must seek the Lord for light that we might have wisdom just what to do, so that if possible, these souls might be saved. 
Some of us then met to pray over the case three times a day. They were serious. These were students, but they were souls to be saved. And so the faculty, some of them, got together three times a day to ask God to deal with the situation. McGann continues. That Sunday, I called Mr. Clayton into my room and I talked to him about his conduct. I told him plainly that I did not know what action the faculty would take in the case, but that it, that it was useless, his staying with us any longer, unless he had more power from on high. For just as sure as temptation came out again, he would fall into it. He said that he knew that that was so and that it would be only a matter of time until he would fall into some other snare. I tried to talk kindly to him, says McGann, and to tell him where he could find help and pardon and peace. And McGann knew where because McGann himself had experienced where to find help and pardon and peace. He continues, I knew that the Lord had been answering our prayers and that the Spirit had been striving with him, Mr. Clayton. The thought had seemed so good to me, says McGann, of late, that the Spirit of God is at our command and to go, to go and strive with souls who need it. Ellen White's letter to Haskell from June 25, the summer before, had just been published in November, where she said the, the Holy Spirit awaits our demand and reception for the purpose of reaching souls. And McGann believed that that promise was true. He, Mr. Clayton, seemed deeply touched, but he did not make any break. So McGann spent a, a good amount of time on a Sunday striving with this student Clayton, but it didn't completely work out yet. The next evening, says McGann, I had Miss Rose Neal up. She had professed to be a Christian for years, but had never known the power of God to save from sin. She seemed to be very sorry for the way she had acted, and she said that she would do better if she could. We talked together and read the Bible, and then notice, when she saw what it meant to take God at his word and the power that there was in a single promise. The whole thing seemed to flash over her soul like a wave of golden glory from heaven above. It was really the moment of her conversion, says McGann. And I never saw anyone so thankful for the love of God as she was at that time. I mean, what a glorious experience, a teacher striving with a student who comes to realize that you can actually take God at his word. Well, the following evening, Mr. Clayton was in again, says McGann, and after a long struggle, he gave way. I never had such an experience, says McGann, with anyone in my life but the results were worth all that it cost. Now Rose and now Mr. Clayton were surrendering their lives to the Lord. Well, I then went over to West Hall to tell Mrs. Prescott, says uh, McGann, and she met me at the door with tears in her eyes for her nephew, Ed Prescott, had just come over to tell her he too had seen light in the promises of God and was going to be a Christian. 
Well, you can imagine now what might take place when these students surrender their lives. These are the rebels of the school, and they're surrendering their lives to the Lord. Well, McGann continues, he says, Then the thing went all through the halls, and everywhere students became convicted of their sins, and without notice, any effort on the part of the teachers, they began to beg for someone to come and help them. I think there were about 10 who took hold that night, says McGann. Most, if not all of them, had never made any profession at all. Some had been out and out infidels. Listen, the, the faculty were, yes, they were praying, and they were at times actively working with some of the students, but this was not something brought on by human effort. The Holy Spirit was doing a marvelous thing on this campus. Notice this is what Prescott said, writing about it later. He says, although the occurrence was unknown to other students at the time, it seemed to be a signal for a general move. There seemed to come upon the students in their private rooms during the evening study hour, at which time these young men made their move, such a spirit as they could not resist, and they were impelled to leave their room, rooms and seek for help. Some were for a time in great distress of mind. The teachers were at hand, who were at hand, went to work at once to help those who desired help. And for several hours, nothing else occupied the attention of both teachers and students. Without any prearranged plans, praise meetings were held in the private rooms and in the parlor, and one after another yielded to the moving of the Holy Spirit. By the way, this is November, when the revivals in the churches around the country were taking place as well. Well, that afternoon, that very afternoon, the mail brought some articles from Sister White. Now remember, Sister White's in Australia, and she wrote testimonies, three of them, and stuck them in the mail, and they arrived there that very day. In my absence, says Prescott, Mrs. Prescott was considerably perplexed to know what to do with them. She thought, however, the next morning that it was providential that these testimonies had come at just that time, and she sent one of them over that a portion of it might be read to the students. This was done at the chapel exercise. So Ellen White sends letters. They arrive the very day that this situation comes up where these students who had been involved in trouble came to the Lord, and then this movement started taking place uh, throughout the school. And by the way, there was about 350 students at the college. I don't know which letter Mrs. Prescott gave to P.T. McGann to read a portion from. There's three of them, and I don't know which one she read for, uh, he read from. I don't know if it was this one testimony, but would you like to know what the name of one of the testimonies was? <laughs> that was the name. And this is what she said. In contemplating the love of Christ, your heart will be softened to deal with the youth as with younger members of the Lord's family. You will remember that they are Christ's property and your disposition will be to deal with them after the manner in which Christ has dealt with you. Harsh dealing will never help the youth to see his errors or aid him to reform. Let the rules and regulations of the school be carried out in the spirit of Jesus, and when reproof must be given, let this disagreeable work be done with sorrow, blended with love. Do not feel that it is your work to openly rebuke the pupil and thus humiliate him before the whole school. Whew. You know what I mean? They were planning to do that. 
and they decided not to. This will not be a proper example to set before the children, for it will be seed that will bear a like harvest. I can just imagine that the faculty, when they read this testimony, were saying, Lord Jesus, thank you. We went to you in prayer to ask what to do. And before they even got the answer that God was already working to show them what to do by actually bringing conversion to these students' hearts. Well, whatever letter P.T. McGann read, the portion or few paragraphs he read to the student body that morning, the, the next, which was the next morning after these students had confessed, something happened. Notice, a letter from Mrs. White arrived and was read to the school during chapel period. Some phrases seem to powerfully encapsulate the gospel. In the context, the message touched a tender chord. The response was electric. The offenders, notice, gave public confession. And the impression on the student body was profound. This amazes me. The faculty were ready to stand them up themselves before the student body and to basically humiliate them. And Ellen White said, if you do that, you will be planting seeds that will of a different kind. Now, when the Holy Spirit is allowed to work, he brings conversion, and the same students stood up before the same student body and of their own accord confessed. And the end result was that it sparked a revival in the entire school. And this is what Prescott says. It took hold of all hearts with wonderful power. And it was evident that there was better work to be done that day than recite lessons. We're canceling school. It was therefore decided at once to dispense with the recitations and continue the religious services. The meeting continued for four hours, and during that time there were between 40 and 50 who made practically their first start in the Christian life. It was a wonderful occasion. The power of God was present in a very marked manner. Personal work was done, and those who had long been held in sin seemed ready to respond to the invitation to accept Christ and to yield themselves to the service of God. There was notice, though, no excitement, but the deep movings of the Spirit of God were plainly discerned. There were about 350 students in the chapel, and over 300 took part in the meeting. There were as many as 50 or more on their feet at one time. You can't do that with a group of young people unless the Holy Spirit is behind it. Well, I, I'm telling you, I'm just, again, scratching the surface. There, there's so much that was going on during these months, November, December, and spilling over into the early part of 1893. Well, the week of prayer came up. It started December 17 and ran through the, fall, the Sabbath of the 24th. And on Thursday, about three days before the week of prayer ended, the uh, school would be out for winter uh, break, Christmas break. And Prescott had returned from Washington back to Battle Creek, so he was there in time for the week of prayer. And on uh, that very week, I think it was on uh, the 22nd of December, he received another mailing of testimonies from Sister White, sent from Australia. And as W.W. W. Prescott um, read those testimonies, some of them were speaking very strongly against the continued resistance to the light that God was sending Resistance that even four years later was still going on. And although Prescott had 
for many, for several years, repented for hit the past and had been actively proclaiming this at the camp meetings, the testimony still convicted him and he felt that he wanted to say something to the students. Now mind you, this is the president of the college. Well, this is how he describes it. Thursday morning, December 22, there was a very tender spirit in the chapel exercises and a special blessing seemed near at hand. Our public prayer service was held at 10, 15 to 11 while the faculty were holding their season of prayer and I felt the duty laid upon me most heavily to make a statement concerning some of the matters connected with my past life. When the students returned to the chapel, instead of continuing our recitation work, a short selection from the testimonies was read and I then made my statement. No effort was made to urge others into the similar experience, but it seemed a signal for a general spirit of confession to break out. What is he talking about? Well, Professor Prescott got up, he read a section of the testimony, and then he confessed that he had been one who resisted this light. And he had a hard time getting through his talk without weeping. This is how his, the biographer, uh, the biography on Prescott states it. It says, Prescott returned on December 15 in time to lead out in previously scheduled week of prayer. At the end of the week of prayer, the last day of the school term, another letter from Mrs. White arrived and was read in the chapel by Prescott. Breaking into tears, even as he read, the conscientious Prescott frankly confessed his past diffidence in responding to the new light, righteousness by faith. Again, the student body was stirred. And that final sentence is an understatement. This was, it was noon, chapel was out, it's the last day of school, students are free to go home now for Christmas break. But a testimony time began. Do you know what time that meeting got out? Ten fifteen that night. You can't do that with a group of students unless the Holy Spirit is doing something. I have never known, says Prescott as he talks about this situation, any similar experience. Such a sense of our utter sinfulness, our wretchedness and the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the need that help which come through accepting Christ and His fullness seemed to rest upon all hearts. Personally, I have never known such horror of sin as took hold of me that day and others felt the same way. Prescott had felt terribly convicted. Even though he'd been proclaiming this message, he realized what what, ha what a person, especially in his position, can do when resisting light and how it can affect others. And he, he felt such a conviction, he poured his heart out to the student body. Confessions were made by both teachers and students, and the Spirit of God was present to witness to the character of the work. There was nothing, noticed like a fanatical outbreak of anything to bring a reproach upon the cause of God. Everyone recognized it was the work of the Spirit which while it convicted of sin, notice, was still a comforter. So yeah, it brought conviction of sin and the wretchedness of sin, but it, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to bring us to despair. The Holy Spirit comes to show us where we can get relief from this sin. No one gave up to discouragement, but there was such a hungering and a thirsting after righteousness as had not been experienced before in our midst. There, you have to read his letter. He actually sent a copy of the letter of this revival out to all the colleges at the time. And interestingly enough, similar revivals were taking place at the same time on other academy and college campuses. This is what uh, an article in the Review had to say. It says, the week of prayer uh, was a grand success in this church. 
uh, talking about another place. I never witnessed such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit as we had during the whole time of the meetings, and especially on Sabbath, December 24. I never saw such great freedom as was manifested on the part of all present. Confessions were made and souls revived. Our young, one young lady made a start for the first time. There are numerous articles from other places in the United States as well as uh, other places around the world where during this week of prayer, revivals were taking place and they all uh, were similar in what was happening. People were freed to confess their great need and to also have assurance of where that need could be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to have to move on even though we could spend a good hour more on this time. Well, battle, during this very time, uh, Prescott had an idea about evangelism. And by the way, I forgot to mention, when the students got out of school during this revival, they had to, they had to share. They were being invited to people's homes to share their personal testimonies in Battle Creek. They got involved in medical missionary work during the break. Um, Prescott himself decided Battle Creek, there's many non-Adventists living here. We need to have an evangelistic series in this town. But notice what he thought. He said, I know you will be glad, he's writing to Ellen White, to learn that we are about to begin work in this city. I have felt deeply impressed in this direction and did not feel free until I had conferred with Elder Olson about the matter. We called together several of the brethren and all were in favor of such a move. The brethren have asked me to take charge of the work and I have decided to conduct it as a series of gospel meetings in which the first effort will be to bring the gospel as the power of God to the people that souls may be really converted to God. Then we shall seek to instruct them in all the truth. Do you see what Prescott is thinking? He's thinking, why not take this message of righteousness by faith to the people first? Not assuming just because they're Christian that they understand these truths that God has given to us as a people, but start there. And then when they've been really converted to God, present the other truths. Well, we hear reports indicating that God is working in a special manner for his people. We are taking fresh courage and are praying daily for rain in the time of the latter rain. And you remember from yesterday afternoon, they were writing and talking about this. The loud cry had begun. Ellen White said so. And it was the time of the latter rain, the drops of which they were feeling beginning to fall all around. One of the churches actually asked, non-Adventist churches asked if A.T. Jones could come and do a series on religious liberty in their church. One of the churches, this is a picture of the Congregational Church who let them have their church to do this series that Prescott was talking about. I wish we had more time to go through that. Prescott actually, this meeting went for three months. He preached a sermon on the Sabbath with Christ in the center. There was one lady, a non adventist that came, first Adventist sermon she ever heard. She walked out of that building looking for someone to tell them, I want to be a Seventh-day Adventist. One sermon. But I'm out of time. So... 1893, this same revival carried over into the 1893 General Conference. We could spend two hours just on how that revival spilled over into the conference. Some of the leading brethren who had opposed this message actually gave confession publicly. J.H. Morrison was one of them. Owe Olson said he'd never seen a confession like that. And the effect that it had on the people there. It was marvelous. But we have to move on. And this is the saddest part of this story. And I tell you, <laughs> somehow I feel like I'm not convincing enough to tell you what was happening. The revivals, the genuine revivals that were taking place. 
By the time of the student revival at Battle Creek College in December of 1892, there was still nonetheless a great deal of alienation among church leaders. The revival at the college, which was a dramatic proportions of dramatic proportions, and resulted in 30 being baptized, was labeled as mere excitement by Uriah Smith and others, and this put a dampening effect on the work. You had students whose lives were changed, and now those who were older than them were telling them, this is fanaticism, it's only excitement. J.H. Kellogg, who had been had between 60 and 70 workers from the sanitarium attending the college, deemed the revival as merely a, quote, very exciting and sensational time. He did not encourage the same effort at the sanitarium because he had, quote, never seen results from this sort of work. And it's that kind of thing, among others, I believe that eventually put a stop to what God was seeking to do. This is how A.T. Jones said it years later. He said, then when the camp meeting's time came, we all three, Jones, Wagner, and Ellen White, visited the camp meetings with the message of righteousness by faith and religious liberty, sometimes all three of us being in the same meeting. This turned the tide with the people and apparently with most of the leading men, but this latter was only apparent. It was never real for all the time in the General Conference Committee and amongst others, there was a secret antagonism always carried on. And A.T. Jones was correct. It wasn't everyone, but there was enough and key people. Yes, good people that had given their lives to the work, but they somehow were offended by this message or saw danger in it and they identified it as fanaticism. Well, is it possible? I actually had a, a person really a little bit upset with me for suggesting that we can actually delay or put a stop as a church or as a people to the beginning of the loud cry. But you know, Ellen White had stated these kind of things even before 1888, that it was possible. Notice 1885, she says, there was a situation that came up in California with an evangelistic series and there was some fanaticism involved and then uh, some, some people dealt with it, but this is what she said. She said, when an effort shall be made in the work of God, Satan will be on the ground to urge himself to notice. But shall it be the work of ministers to stretch out their hand and say, this must go no further, for it is not the work of God. If this is the way you manage when God sins good, be assured the revivals will be rare. When the Spirit of God comes, it will be called fanaticism as in the day of Pentecost. And we remember that did happen during Pentecost. 18, um, 86, she said this, some are looking forward to the latter rain to do the work for them that God wants do, should be done now. They will become so cold they will not recognize the latter rain. Their probation closes and they are laid in the grave unfit for their last change. They did not make themselves ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. What will eternity be for this class? So, and this is just a couple of many that I find where Ellen White does say that it's possible to not actually recognize the latter rain or to actually recognize that light that God sends that's to lighten the whole earth with its glory. 1888, she said this very same thing. She said, I shall never, I think, be called to stand under the direction of the Holy Spirit as I stood at Minneapolis. The presence of Jesus was with me. All assembled in that meeting had an opportunity to place themselves on the side of truth by receiving the Holy Spirit, which was sent by God in such rich, a rich current of love and mercy. But in the rooms occupied by some of our people was heard ridicule, criticism, jeering, and laughter. And then she had said clearly, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit were attributed to fanaticism. 1889. Those who lived just prior to the second appearing of Christ may expect a large measure of his Holy Spirit. And I, those are my words. I believe that she's talking about the latter rain. But if they do not watch and pray, they will go over the same ground of refusing the message of mercy 
as the Jews did in the time of Christ. And then she adds these words in parentheses. If God has ever spoken by me, some of our leading men are going over the same ground. So I do think that Ellen White makes it clear that this can happen. Another time, 1889, she says the true religion, the only religion of the Bible that teaches forgiveness through the merits and of a crucified and risen Savior, that advocates righteousness by faith of the Son of God, has been slighted, spoken against, ridiculed, and when she published this letter later, she added the words, and rejected, it has been denounced as leading to enthusiasm and fanaticism. Take it back, she says, while it is not too late for wrongs to be righted, for you have sinned against God. So even before 1892, Ellen White had warned that this light could be identified as fanaticism. And what a great sin that will be. Well, this is what Ellen White had to say about the revivals of, 80, of 1892 and 1893. And because of, for uh, several reasons, one of which I think the most important was the fact that it was being identified as fanaticism. The second was that the blessings were not followed up on and, and there wasn't a movement forward under the power of the Holy Spirit. That revival began to die away the summer of 1893. And this is what Ellen White wrote to W.W. W. Prescott in 1893. She says, Oh, how my heart has been pained to see that the precious light given in Battle Creek at the last General Conference, 1893, was not so cherished that every lamp was trimmed and burning because supplied with the oil of grace. All the revelations of God at the conference I acknowledge as from him. I dare not say that work was excitement and unwarranted enthusiasm. No, no, God drew near to you, she says to Prescott, and his Holy Spirit revealed to you that he had a heaven full of blessing, notice, even light to lighten the world. Where's she quoting that from? Revelation 18.1. She continues to Prescott. Had the manifestations of the Holy Spirit been rightly appreciated, it would have accomplished for the receiver that which God designed it should. A good work in the perfecting of character in the likeness of Christ. But there was a want of consecration to God, a lack of self-denial, humiliation, and through misapplication, misapplication and misappropriation, the work has given rise to doubt and unbelief. It is even questioned whether it was the work of God or a wave of fanaticism and oh how Satan exalts. When God works, truly works, and it's attributed to fanaticism, how Satan exalts. Well, she wrote another letter, same fall of 93 to Uriah Smith, who was one of the key persons voicing these things. And she says, there has been uh, things written to me in regard to the movings of the Spirit of God at the last conference and at the college, which clearly indicate that because these blessings were not lived up to, minds have been confused. And that which was light from heaven has been called excitement. I have been made sad to have this matter viewed in this light. We must be very careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God in pronouncing the ministration of the Holy Spirit as a species of fanaticism. And let no one venture to say, this is not the Spirit of God. It is just that which we are authorized to believe and pray for. There were people praying for this because God had promised, we're in the time of the latter rain. The loud cry is beginning. And now it was being identified as fanaticism. She continues to Smith, If he sends his Holy Spirit, there are those who do not understand its operations and how to appreciate the glory of God shining upon them. And unless they do discern the movings of the Spirit of God, they will call light darkness, and darkness will be chosen rather than light. 
I have been afraid, Ellen White says, terribly afraid that those who felt the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness, and then notice she adds, for I have no doubt, for I have not one doubt, but that they did receive the Spirit. They will come to the conclusion that God's heaven-sent blessings are a delusion. When God shall let his light shine again, how many will resist it and not respond to it because of the judgment many have passed upon its influence? In other words, those who truly were revived would now be afraid to even respond to similar situations because, well, the last time they said that was fanaticism. Ellen White concludes to Uriah Smith, the results after the working of the Spirit of God in Battle Creek are not because of fanaticism, but because those who were blessed did not show forth the praises of him who called them out of darkness into this marvelous light. And when the earth is to be lightened, is lightened with the glory of God, notice, some will not know what it is from, and from whence it came because they misapplied and misinterpreted the spirit shed upon them. This is, this is heavy thought that God is sharing through Ellen White and sharing to those brethren in 1893, but it's for us today. 1894, Ellen Wright, White wrote several articles in the Review specifically about the college. And this is what she had to say. I fear that the people have permitted the enemy to work along these very lines so that the good which in, em, emanated from God, the rich blessing which he has given, have come to be regarded by some as fanaticism. If this attitude is preserved, then when the Lord shall again let his light shine upon the people, they will turn from the heavenly illumination saying, I felt the same in 1893. And some in whom I had confidence said that the work was fanaticism. Will not those who have received the rich grace of God and who take the position that the work of the Holy Spirit was fanaticism, will they be ready to denounce the operations of the Spirit of God in the future? And unfortunately, the answer is yes, they will be more ready to reject because of what had happened. Well, again, I wish we could go on, but our time is winding down, and I know if I don't tell the rest of the story from the story I started Sabbath afternoon, that my wife and I may not be allowed to get out of Canada. You remember April 6, 1892, Ellen White wrote to S.N. Haskell. And in that short letter, at least six times, she used the word now, and three times she referred by using the words from Revelation 18.1, describing that the very light of Revelation 18.1, that glory which was to lighten the earth, in that final loud cry, under the outpouring of the latter rain, was beginning to shine now. April 6, 1892. Four days later, on April 10, 1892, in Selma, California, the camp meeting held its final meeting, evening meeting. And as the, the campers there at the camp meeting, either went to their tents or some of them went to the hotels in town for the night. Uh, many of them made their way into their rooms in the evening and discussed the things that they had heard during this camp meeting, 1892. And you'll remember this is, you know, a couple years into these camp meetings where revivals were taking place. And in those hotel rooms, like some of them today, you know, you'll have a couple of rooms together side by side with a door in between. And as some of the uh, camp meeting uh, attendees went back to their rooms, they lit lanterns and they sat around and talked. 
and some of them even opened the doors to their rooms into the next room so that they could converse with with other uh, Adventist believers uh, you know during the evening and this is what happened as one of the uh, camp meeting attendees uh, went to his room little lantern opened the door and the light of his lantern shone through that door into the other room beside him there sat in the chair on the other side of the room a man by the name of John F. Baylor and you'll remember what we read uh, Sabbath afternoon from Brother Godsmark the Bible director had said when John F. Baylor in 1891, the year before, had been at his Bible school, Brother Baylor had stated at that time that it was his belief, if he remained faithful to the end, that during the special outpouring of the latter rain, his eyes would be restored. And he cited John 9.3. Now for those of you who were not here, I'll just have to tell you that John F. Baylor was a blind man because he'd had his eyes completely removed when he was 18 years old. And he'd become an Adventist, sold, Cole Porter, Cole Portered with his wife. 1891, he's telling this brother God's mark, I actually believe when the latter rain is poured out, God's going to restore my sight. Well, as that door was opened and that light began to shine through the door, on Brother Baylor. Maybe I'll just let him tell you what happened. Brother Frank Thorpe, my wife, daughter, and myself were talking on the subject of healing in answer to prayer. When suddenly the light of the lamp made such an impression as to cause me to exclaim, what is that? It was the lamp 16 feet away, it was the adjoining room, and the door between the rooms had been opened. April 10, 1892. For some months previous, I had been exercised, says John F. Baylor, in reference to the possibility of having my eyes restored by divine power. For I knew there was no other source of help. And you're not kidding, Brother Baylor. As my life, as my faith increased, he says, new eyeballs have been gradually growing and sight increasing. I can now see sufficiently to distinguish light from darkness, some colors, and the movements of persons, I can see men walking as trees. They appear tall like trees. My sight is best at twilight. I have reason to believe and hope that my sight will be fully restored. Don't ask me to explain this, because I cannot explain it. It took a year and a half for this story to make it into the review. Because six ministers needed to interview Brother Baylor and go see him, who had known him as a blind man, and to come back and say, yeah, he was totally blind, had no eyeballs, and he has eyeballs now, and he's beginning to see. But why just partially see? You know, Jesus did heal a blind man one time where it was only partial. In the story of the healing of the blind man in John chapter 9, Jesus actually used the healing of a blind man as a parable, if you will, to speak about the blindness spiritually of Israel. Brother Baylor goes on, Lately, an oculist or an eye doctor examined and investigated my eyes two successive days and finally reluctantly admitted 
that in all history no case had been recorded of a man ever seeing after the eyeballs had been taken out. It must be our conclusion, therefore, that a notable miracle has been done entirely without the aid of human agency. To God be all praise. So what about this idea that John F. Baylor believed he would receive his eyesight when the latter rain fell? 1894, there's another article in the review, late 1894, actually the article didn't come out till January 1 of 95, but he was in uh, Minnesota, and this is what it says. Brother John F. Baylor was here in the city for several weeks. His eyeballs are steadily growing, and his ability to distinguish objects is better. With him, we sought the Lord for his power to heal others who were variously afflicted. The Lord did greatly bless in restoring, for which we praise his name. So here, you know, a year and a half later, his eyesight is still improving. And I'm not going to tell you what you should think, but this is how I look at this. And it fits with thoughts that I have been impressed with even before the Lord brought this story to me. The latter rain is not something that just one day it's not here and bam, one day it is. Now on Pentecost, it was a set time and there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was poured out many other times besides that. The latter rain, I believe, as I read about this history, is it's like the dew or the dropping rain that begins to grow from just, you know, a sprinkle to a shower to a downright downpour as God's people accept and pray for more. It's like the, the sun rising brighter and brighter until the perfect day. And here's why. I'll explain why I think it's this way. This was January 1, 1895. Five months later, May 1, Ellen White writes this well-known statement. The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to His people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith and the surety it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, that's a loud cry, and attended with the outpouring of His Spirit in a large measure. January 1896, and I can't go into all the things that were happening at this time, but Ellen White wrote this summary statement. God, to those in Battle Creek, God has revealed himself again and again in a most marked manner in Battle Creek. He has given a large measure of his Holy Spirit to the believers there. It has come unexpectedly at times, and there has been deep movings upon hearts and minds, a letting go of selfishness, selfish purposes, and bringing into the treasury many things that you were convicted God had forbidden you to have. This blessing extended to large numbers, but why was not this sweet, holy working continued upon hearts and minds? Some felt annoyed at this outpouring and their own natural dispositions were manifested, they said, quote, this is only excitement. It is not the Holy Spirit, not showers from heaven of the latter rain. There were hearts full of unbelief who did not drink in of the Spirit, but who had bitterness 
in their souls. May 22, 1896. Ellen White writes, If the power of Satan can come into the very temple of God, and she's writing to O.A. Olson at Battle Creek, and manipulate things as he pleases, the time of preparation will be prolonged. And notice, here is the secret of the movements made to oppose the men whom God sent with a message of blessing for his people. Do you want to know the secret behind the opposition? It's this. These men were hated. The men and God's message were despised as verily as Christ himself was hated and despised at his first advent. I have not read more heart-wrenching letters than from 1896 that Ellen White wrote. June 1896, Ellen White writes to Uriah Smith. She quotes Galatians 324, the schoolmaster, and she identifies it as primarily applying to the moral law. And then she says, an unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through Brethren Wagner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world. As the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost, the light that is to enlighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted, and by the actions of our own brethren, has been in a great degree kept from the world. There's something else interesting happened in 1896. I have, did a whole series on the Sunday Laws. And there was somewhere between 250 and 300 Adventists arrested for, break, you know, for violating Sunday Laws, not only in the United States, but uh, Canada and in other countries. Now that's when the church membership is 30,000. If you were to extrapolate the same ratio, it would be like 300,000 or 200,000 Seventh-day Adventists being arrested today. But 1896 is where those arrests peaked and then died away, even though the laws are still on the books in the United States. In 1898, Baylor was mentioned, John F. Baylor was mentioned in the review again, but nothing was said about him being blind or not. In 1898, Ellen White had a dream, and for the first time, she realized that she would not live to see the second coming. In 1900, there was Brother Baylor's books were advertised, or his book, and it only mentions him as a blind brother. In 1901, Ellen White wrote this, man cannot possibly stretch over that gulf that has been made by workers who have not been following the divine leader. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel, but notice, but for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. At least 15 times in separate statements between 1883 and 1915, Ellen White made statements to the effect that Christ could have come before this. 
In 1909, Baylor was mentioned twice in the review, and he was identified as our blind brother and one of our blind agents. In 1915, Ellen G. White died. In 1917, John F. Baylor died. And his obituary says he died a blind man. He got so discouraged, his Adventist second wife died. He actually quit coming to church for a while. And then about a year before he died, somewhere around th that time, he came back, rejoiced in the Lord, and went to his grave. But I wonder how many times he questioned, why? And what I think is that it's an object lesson to what God was beginning to do. He was beginning to pour out the Holy Spirit in latter rain portions. And John F. Baylor's eyesight was being restored. And when that light was not accepted. The Holy Spirit reluctantly was withdrawn. God will withdraw His Spirit unless His truth is accepted. Ellen White said this in eight, about a meeting in 1890. Sabbath in the office chapel was held a meeting when the Spirit of the Lord came nigh to us. Christ knocked for entrance, but no room was made for Him. The door was not opened, and the light of His glory so nigh was withdrawn. God will not be trifled with. The sin committed in what took place at Minneapolis remains on the record books of heaven, and when these persons who tried and brought over the ground again, the same Spirit will reveal, be revealed when the Lord has sufficiently tried them. If they do not yield to Him, He will withdraw His Holy Spirit. I'm not making this up. It's in our history. But as I close, I want to tell you what concerns me today. What are we telling the next generation? In the, the exuberant Jones, this is about 1892 and 93, unfortunately misread the November 22 loud cry statement of Ellen White's, confused the loud cry, a message, with the latter rain a power to propel it, and he whipped up an, quite an eschatological excitement at the 1893 General Conference session. That is not true. There is, for example, a fairly direct line from Jones in the post-Minneapolis period to the Holy Flesh Movement in Indiana in 1900. This is what's being claimed in these books. While Jones was not in sympathy with the Indiana movement, many of its holy flesh ideas were extensions of his teachings on righteousness by faith beginning at least as early as 1889. How can we say that? How can we say the holy flesh fanaticism is just an extension of what Jones and Wagner and Prescott were teaching on righteousness by faith? It's not true. Another book came out here a couple years ago. Many writers, one of the editors I really respect, he's not responsible for this statement, but under the Holy Flesh section, the writer of that section had this to say. The Holy Flesh movement was a radical holiness-oriented revival that arose among Seventh-day Adventists in Indiana in 1899 and 1900. This movement has its, had its roots in a holiness thrust that began sweeping through North American Adventism in 1892. 
The first wave of this revival, led by Jones Prescott, took place between 92 and 4, particularly in the area around Battle Creek, Michigan. Jones and Prescott preached that the Holy Spirit was about to descend in the latter rain and that it would produce the loud cry of the third angel. They also promoted physical healing as a manifestation of the Holy Spirit's work. But is, that to, is the Holy Flesh movement the responsibility of those true revivals? Not at all. Another book coming out this summer. If Jones, for example, had had his way at the 1893 General Conference session, he would have led the denomination off into charismatic excess rather than the promised latter rain. Somehow, someday, a generation has to rise up and believe the truth about our history. There is in Jerusalem a wall. Where the Jews come to pray. I even looked this up on Google because I wondered, I wonder what they pray for. And there were some articles there that, that did mention this. Some of them, especially probably the Orthodox, are there asking God, when are you going? to send the promised Messiah. And I wonder how can God answer that prayer? I mean, I know he hears them, but I can just, you know, picture him stooping down through any means he can and trying to whisper in their ears, my brother, my son, my daughter, I did send the Messiah. And your forefathers hung him on a tree. And in order for that Jew to really come to the hope that he's looking for, he has to acknowledge what really happened when the Messiah did come. And I wonder as well if we as Adventists don't also have a wailing wall of sorts. For 150 plus years, we have believed and prayed knowing that before Christ can come, there's going to be a message to encircle this globe. And we have prayed for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's even been movements about praying at a certain time every day for the latter rain. I'm not saying that's bad. But I wonder if God doesn't stoop down to us in a similar way and say, my son, my daughter, I did send the beginning of the latter rain and your forefathers identified him as fanaticism. And until you or a generation arises that's willing to acknowledge that, you're doomed to repeat the same mistake. That's why I have such a burden that this story be told. I'm going to close with these thoughts from Ellen White. Those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel think of it in relation to themselves and to the world. Few think of its relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All have, heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with His manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our 
dull senses of the pain that from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God. Every departure from right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. Our world is a vast laser house, a scene of misery that we dare not allow even our thoughts to dwell upon. Did we realize it as it is, the burden would be too terrible. Yet God feels it all. In order to destroy sin and its results, he gave his best beloved, and he has put it in our power through cooperation with him to bring this sin of misery to an end. And I believe that somehow this message of righteousness by faith, which I know I have not presented it in its fullness, only the history in a part about it, somehow that message has to change and transform us. May we be that generation who says, Lord, forgive me and forgive us as a people for the suffering we have put you through, and God, please send back the latter rain. Will you stand with me? Father, I thank you tonight for your mercy to us. And Lord, how can we not but see how long-suffering you have been? Lord, I don't know how you want to speak to our hearts tonight, what you want to say, but I know, Lord, you have so much more you want to do in our lives. I pray you will bless each person here. Be with the pastor, be with this church, be with every member, I pray. And Lord, bring a revival to our hearts, and I pray that you will truly help us to understand and see and experience this message which you have so long hoped and desired to manifest in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.